Hope you're all doing well. We got a little bit of, seems like in the movie Mary Poppins, the wind is changing. Just seems that a little bit in the market. You know, Russell in the last RUT uh, in the last five weeks has dropped over 7%. So we're, you know, we're almost correcting in Russell. SPX is just kind of coming now, right? Two weeks ago it hit highs, and now we're coming we're down about two, two to from two, two and a half percent off the high. So SPX is a little more gently coming down, except the last three days, if someone pointed out in one of our shared mentoring sessions earlier, we've been down what, 75, 80 points in three days in SPX. So that's where the SPX, or why the VIX was up about 18, right? Earlier, 1790 earlier. VIX has just dropped since I grabbed a little, had a few tackles for lunch. I dropped a point, right? As SPX is coming back here with a vengeance, right? So as we literally over the last 40 minutes, would you agree, uh, SPX and Rudd are coming back big time, right? I mean, VIX has dropped a point. I mean, again, we're still much higher levels than we've been most of the last year, but uh, it's been impressive the last hour things have come back. Anyways, as Bob says, I like tackles and SPX, a good combination. So here we are today, and I'm just going to talk a little bit of a preview today for our next online class that is starting. So let's jump in, folks. You can see the screen okay. So this is for educational purposes today. All right, so here is the, this class coming up managed by the Greeks. Um, it'll be a three-week class. Uh, it'll be starting Monday, October 22nd, which is two weeks from today. Uh, we'll be running at 1 o'clock Central Time each class. These are the class dates, October 22, 24, October 29, 31, no 5th, and we'll end on no 7th. So it'll be six classes over three weeks, Mondays and Wednesdays. Cost will be $297. Uh, class time will be minimum one hour each session. All classes are recorded and archived, and you can ask questions anytime. So if you can only watch one or two classes live, that's fine. As you're watching them recorded, you can send me in questions. There'll be a class page, you ask Dan a question, the questions will come to me. Three months after the class, you can ask questions also. Uh, every class that I do, I'll put on a live trade uh, just because it's, I think it makes it more practical of whatever I'm teaching that day, and then we'll follow it through. Trying to make things as practical as possible for you. <clears throat> so that's the new class, again, starting two weeks from today. There'll be information to sign up on the front page of Shared and Mentoring, and uh, we'd love to see you there. All right, class topics that will be covered. This is just a list of uh, a, a rough agenda of the types of things that will be covered during the class. So class topics covered, a lot of you may ask, you know, when you have a position on what delta should I adjust at? Right, whether you do one contract or five contracts or ten, what would be a decent guideline for that? <clears throat> and Jay Bailey, who works with me, has for a long time, is come up with some very sharp uh, metrics, how you can figure out as a retail trader what delta uh, is too big and you should cut back your position, and he'll share that with you. I would say managed by the Greeks is just managing by your Greeks, you know, your delta, your theta, your vega, your gamma, and, and stuff like that. But I put what are five key cockpit metrics, you know, because this is very similar to me managing option trades, very similar to being in a cockpit of an airplane. Now, have I ever been in a cockpit of an airplane? No. Have I ever flown an airplane for your sake? No. But... As I talk to pilots and they have these metrics, they mean a lot, right? And they're, they're kind of help them manage the, the flight. Well, 
I'm going to be going over the five key cockpit metrics and managing by the Greeks, explaining how they work together and everything. And those are going to be your gamma, delta, theta, vega, but I throw in margin uh, or risk, which is it, it, very important. And then once we have these five key metrics, what triggers it? Like if you're in a cockpit, you have these metrics, right? But what can affect that? What can affect it? You can say weather, agree? Well, what are three key weather criteria that drive the performance in the cockpit? And we'll be looking at, let's say it's SPX, SPX. We'll be looking at VIX levels. We'll be looking speed of the market because based on those three weather criteria, that's going to determine what I do with these metrics, how I manage these metrics in flight. And, and, and no different, I'm going on a, uh, do some live seminars on the West Coast tomorrow. And as we get in an airplane, based on the weather, won't that, again, I don't know if there's any pilots here, but won't the weather conditions maybe determine, have an effect on the metrics or how you manage that? And then we'll talk about rules-based risk management versus managing by the Greeks. I think managing by the Greeks is how we managed in the pits, how most traders manage it. It's just more thorough and accurate than a rules-based system, right? Rules-based is, you know, if it goes up, do this, goes down, it does that. You may say, Dan, I like rules-based system. Yeah, I, I, I like rules-based system too, but most of the time the rules-based system you have to modify it every time the market moves, right? And so risk management by the Greeks, no matter what the weather conditions, you can manage it by the Greeks, whereas a rules-based system is very, very inaccurate a lot of the time. It's assuming a lot of things, uh, which, which it's assuming what the weather conditions will be if the market goes up or down and what you'll do, and uh, it's a little bit of Disney World-ish. How to implement the four-step plan with managed by the Greeks, you know, in terms of when you set, how do you set up a trade, what's your profit target and max loss, when do you adjust and how do you adjust this four-step plan, how is that uh, integrated with managed by the Greeks? So these are just some of the topics we'll get into. Key, when did your trade get in trouble? Show you how by looking at a graph that you can know when your trade gets in trouble. Contrast managing short versus long duration trades by the Greeks and just make you a much more thorough and, and confident trader. What's the most important Greek? How to manage, now we get into some of the strategies, credit spreads, iron condors, butterflies, calendars. We'll jump into that by the Greeks. How to manage cash secured puts, covered rights, long diagonals. How to manage big trades by the Greeks. How to manage multiple positions and SPX and RUT by the Greeks, kind of an end of the day fire drill that we used to do in the pits a lot that can help you as you're managing your trades. Talk a little bit about volatility trading and then how do market makers, you know, I was in the pits for 20 some years in Chicago, how do they manage the trades? And so this should be a very thorough, power packed three week class, uh, whatever level you're at, I think it could be a big help to you. It just brings you in the real world how to manage these, you know, how you're supposed to be managing these trades. One quick thing I want to tell you before I jump into a few examples is just, I don't know where a lot of you live, but just to let you know, I'm going to be doing a few seminars this week, and if you're in the area, we'd love to have you. Uh, tomorrow night, Tuesday the 9th, I'm going to be doing a live seminar in Tempe, Arizona. If you're interested, send me an email, dan at sheridanmentoring.com, and I can get you some information. It'll be a two- to three-hour seminar at night. Uh, I think it'll be at this real Salada Community College, um, but it'll be like a two- to three-hour live seminar. It'll be free, hosted by a group out there. And uh, I'd love to see you. I'd love to uh, – it would be a good opportunity. We'll get into a lot of different slides and stuff. Uh, Thursday evening, I'll be in Silicon Valley. And if you're interested in that, uh, send me an email that will be hosted by a group out there uh, in Silicon Valley. 
So if you're interested Thursday evening of this week, send me an email. And then finally, Friday, we'll be putting on a seminar in Huntington Beach in the afternoon. Uh, this Friday, these are all two, three-hour seminars. And uh, I'm working on all the slides today, so it should be a good uh, seminar. Be glad to meet you. All right, well, let's move on. So talking about this concept of managing by the Greeks, so let's jump in, look at a few examples of what the Greeks tell us. And you say, what is managing by the Greeks and why it's important? Managing by the Greeks is looking like a, in the cockpit, a pilot would look at some of the Greeks, looking at the Greeks, and then as I'm looking at the Greeks, using those to make decisions, but why is it important? Why is it even more important than rules-based? And here's the reason, because you're using all the variables, right? Rules-based system doesn't always look at how the variables change. And so this is very realistic. That's why we used it in the pits. Uh, I'll get one quick question before we get going. Um, Rudy says, why do you ex market makers? First of all, Rudy, I was a specialist. I was a market maker, a little bit different, but kind of similar. Why do you ex market makers when you are off the floor, then the main subject is on the Greeks? And you didn't use the Greeks when you traded on the floor. Rudy, I hate to disappoint you, but that's how we traded on the floor with the Greeks. So, yeah, when we were in the pits, that's how we traded. We traded based on the volatility and looked at the Greeks. Um, so why do I talk about the Greeks now that I'm off the floor? Because I used it on the floor and it was valuable. Um, and it's not as applicable to a retail trader as when I was in the pit, but it's very important. So, uh, so as far as did we use the Greeks on the floor, 122% out of 100. All right, let's move on. So here's an example of a, I'm just, again, just taking a few examples for sake of discussion. Here's a 32-day broken wing iron butterfly, and all I'm saying is when you, if you don't look at the Greeks, right, if you're looking at your credit spread or your covered right or whatever you have, and you're not looking at the Greeks, you're making some assumptions, right? You're making a lot of assumptions. Like I get this all the time. If you look at, you know, here's, an, here's a graph. Well, let's go through this and I'll, I'll tell you what I mean. Here's a graph. Again, it's using the TD Ameritrade Thinkorswim software. So if you'll look, just for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with it, the green line is the expiration graph. The purple line would be the line uh, today. Well, maybe that's using too fat of something. Um, today, the purple line. Uh, here's the underlying. Right, that's the underlying price, 2881. So the green green line is the expiration graph. Purple graph is today. And then you see the red is 2881. So this example would be an iron butterfly. Has anybody ever done an iron butterfly? Anybody ever done an iron butterfly? So the first thing someone might say, hey, Dan, what the heck is an iron butterfly? An iron button, why would you do it? An iron butterfly is you're selling a straight, selling a straddle, the at the money call and put. That's the foundation. You say, well, why would you sell an at the money call and put? Well, those are the options that have the most time premium, that decay the most. So that's called selling premium. You want to sell the options with the most premium. So that's the at the money call and put. That would be called selling a straddle. Well, why don't we just sell a straddle? To get that decay. Well, the problem is the reason we don't just sell a straddle, who can tell me why? So if the foundation of this strategy is to sell at the money call and put, why don't I just do that? It has unlimited risk, and for Elliott Webb, if he sold the short call and put, 
Yeah, as Art says, you're, you'd be shocked at how much capital you'd have to put up at your brokerage firm. So your returns, as Thomas says, your, yeah, your returns would be lower. So I'd like to just sell the call and the put, right? Sell the options with the most time frame. You know, it's the same, wouldn't you love if there was a business where you could, how many would love to get into a business where you sell new cars? Anybody? If you could just sell cars, sell, well, I guess you'd be a dealer, but, but I mean, sell them and then buy them back. In other words, do cars usually decay unless it's a 63 or 60, some of these uh, baby boomers are buying up these cars. Cars decay. Well, that's why people sell premium, sell an at the money call and put, um, because you're selling the options you have the most time decay. So in this case, we're selling the at the money call and put, but we're saying, hey, you know what? I've got to buy something against it because it's just too much capital to put up. So you would buy a call and a put against it. The only reason I'm doing a broken wing butterfly is you can see on the put side, I started out on the put side, the difference between the short put and the long put is 50. The difference between the short put and the long put is 50. Now I started the difference between the short call and the long call at 50, but then I narrowed my, my long call a little bit to 40. And so the bottom line is the only reason I'm doing a broken wing butterfly and all a broken wing means is, you can see here, the width on the put side, the distance between the short put and long put is 50. The distance between the short call and the long call is 40. So when you have unequal widths, it's called broken. The only reason I'm doing broken wing is to get the position deltas close to zero. That's the only reason I'm doing this broken wing at the money iron butterfly is to get the position deltas near zero or within a couple. So here's an example of a 32-day broken wing iron butterfly in the NOV9 expiration. And you can see with the green graph, you make your most money at expiration in 32 days. Here's P&L. You make your most money if it doesn't move that far from the short strike. Why? Because in this case, I'm selling the options that have the most time premium, right? If this is where the underlying is. I'm selling the ones that have the most time premium, and I'm buying further out of the money options against it with less time premium. So why do you make money at expiration if we don't move too far? Because your shorts are going to decay more than your longs. I mean, that's really how you make your money in these. But you can see... Why do I have a lot more risk on the downside than the upside with a broken wing? Because I narrowed my call side. My call side is 40 wide. I'm not sure why this annotation is doing that. I am not sure. And then the put side, the width is 50. So, I originally started my call side at 50, but I narrowed it to 40 to get the position deltas to zero. Anyways, but the main reason I'm doing this is to sell premium. And on a day like today, the VIX was higher. So usually when the volatility uh, VIX is a little higher, means you can get more time premium. You can sell more time premium than if the VIX is 12. So you do something like this. And so, but... A lot of times I'm looking at my metrics, and if you focus on the middle column here, the other columns are if the SPX goes up or down 1%. But if you focus on the middle, well, you can see it here. Here's my Greeks. So I'm looking at my Greeks. I'm in the cockpit of an airplane. So on a day like today where the VIX is 16 to 18, that's kind of the higher end of the range, what it's been most of the last year. So Generally, I want to lean a little bit short deltas. Uh, so first of all, I want to do strategies where I'm short Vega, where I'm selling more time premium than I'm buying. So this would be a day I'd consider something like this. And then when the uh, VIX is up at the 16, 18 level, 
I probably want to be a little bit short, maybe two or three deltas short when I start something, because if the SPX goes up, volatility will go down, and that'll benefit me when I'm short of Vega, all right? So that will kind of make up for what I might lose if I'm short deltas and we go up. So when the volatilities are kind of a little bit higher, I want to be a little bit short deltas against short Vega. So these these uh, Greeks all kind of interact, right? And so when I'm looking at the Greeks, I always want to look at kind of the ultimate SPX levels. I want to look at VIX levels. I want to look at the speed of the market. You know, we've been moving fast, right? SPX the last three days has moved down fast. Russell's been moving down a lot faster. Russell's almost corrected. Russell from the kind of the lows today is down seven or eight percent in the last five weeks. That's almost a correction. SPX from the lows today has been down about two percent. It's kind of lagging behind. So based on SPX levels, VIX, and the speed of, you know, one of the reasons VIX got up to eight, almost 18 today is because we've had three days in a row where total in the SPX were down about, what, 75, 80 points uh, from the lows today. And so that's why it triggers the VIX. So based on when I see the weather conditions, like a pilot in an airplane, I see these weather conditions, it tells me do I want to be short Vega or long Vega. It tells me whether I want to be long delta or short delta. There's a, and that's what we're going to focus a lot on over the next three weeks. How many people do put credit spreads? How many people do put credit spreads or call credit spreads? How many people do credit spreads? Charles and uh, others. And, and, you know, you would normally think on a day like today, uh, with the market down, you would consider, um, you know, if you're neutral to bullish, with the volatilities higher, um, with the volatilities higher, uh, you might consider a put credit spread. Now, one advantage of putting on a put credit spread, this is the expiration graph, which would be in 32 days. The main advantage of doing a credit spread, like a put credit spread, on a day when the VIX is 16 or 17 versus versus if VIX were 11 is what? Two reasons, two things. Number one, you get a lot farther away on your short put than the underlying than you normally would if VIX were 11. And the second thing is you get a little bit more credit, but the main thing is you get a lot more distance away. So this is a 32-day put credit spread. I'm looking at selling one Nov 9 2760 put, buying one Nov 9 2740 put. That's a 20 wide put credit spread. So I have $2,000 of risk. If I bring in a credit of $2.15, 2,000 minus 215, margin or risk for every one of these trades would be about 1785. These are the Greeks. At the time I made the slide, VIX was 1657 up 175. Delta is a little bit long, which you would expect on a put credit spread. Theta, not unusual for a 32-day trade, uh, but pretty small. So again, it's not a short-term trade like a 10-day. In Vega, you're short a little uh, because you're you're going to be short Vega when you're selling more time premium than you're buying, right? Now, so you can see with the underlying here at the time, 2883, we were able to go out about 120 points out of the money and sell the puts. So again, um, we always want to look first, before I kind of look at the Greeks, I've got to look at the SPX. I've got to, or if that's the vehicle I'm trading, I got to look at VIX. Whoops. I got to look at VIX. And then I have to look at the speed of the market. How much are we moving? How fast? You know, are we moving, you know, 1% three days in a row? How much are we moving? Once I look at these three factors, 
then I kind of zero in on do I want to be longer or shorter deltas of theta or vega. And again, we've been down three days in a row. I do a put credit spread, more of a neutral to bullish outlook. Um, and it's a little bit short vega. So generally when the volatility is higher, I want to be more short vega. So like on a day like today, we're not doing as many, you know, we're not doing much uh, strategies where we're buying more time premium than we're selling, like a calendar trade. Uh, something like that. So that's a put credit spread, and we'll talk a lot about that. Um, and, and, and one of the things we'll focus on in the class is, you know, you always have two graphs. You have the expiration graph and then of a put credit spread, and then the purple graph, what it looks like today. And we focus on managing the trades by the graph today, T plus zero. When you're managing trades by the expiration graph, that's called Disney World, right, or Magic Kingdom. That's like we had a big marathon in Chicago yesterday, the 26 miles. Well, that would be like me running it, and after the first mile, I'm talking about where I'm going to go eat Italian food after. It's kind of foolish. I mean, I get through the first mile. So <clears throat> to be a good risk manager, especially managed by the Greeks, we're managing this purple line, not the expiration graph. Again, that's Disney World. And then here's an example how many people have ever managed or tried to manage multiple trades in the same vehicle? Whether it be a stock or an index, maybe you had a covered right on, plus you had something else. Maybe you had two or three trades in the same vehicle. Well, here's an example just to, I mean, these are typical of trades we would manage in the pits because when we were in the pits, we didn't have something you had. It's called choice. You can trade when you want. You can trade when you don't want to trade. You could put on one trade and that's it. When we were in the pits, our job was to be a wholesaler, to take the opposite uh, side of your trades and try to turn it into something beautiful. So we were buying and selling options all day long. Some we wanted, some we didn't, and we'd get a big bowl of soup, right? So if you look at this, here's a, I just put a bunch of trades together. Here's a, Butterfly in the Nov 9 expiration, 30 by 60 by 30. Here's an Iron Condor, 50 times in the Oct 19 expiration, a little shorter term. Here's a calendar where I'm selling the Oct 22, not to another shorter term trade, buying the Nov 5. And then here's a just a plain call vertical debit spread. Well, how many would agree that managing all those separately, boy, it can get confusing. So to me, and how we did it in the pits, we would just put it all in the soup, right? And we would look at what the Greeks were. Again, we'd look at the price of the SPX, the speed, and the VIX, and then we'd look at these factors. So as I put it all together, again, this is your graph today that's the most important. Here's your graph at expiration. And here's where the underlying was at the time, 28.78. So when I look at that, I can see the big characteristic of this mostly, you know, shorter term stuff, right? Stuff that expires, the stuff I'm selling, uh, Oct 19, Oct 22, you know, within 10 to 12 days, a little bit of, sh of longer term stuff. Yeah, it looks like an iron gumbo. But when I look at this, and this trade would be, if we put the margin, be about 168000 But the bottom line is, you just look at the Greeks. And so you could say here, okay, I'm short 87 deltas. My theta is 2,400 positive. That means all my short options are going to decay much, much more than my longs, and that will be my theta today, and this number will grow. This would be short Vegas. So if the VIX generally would go lower, I'd benefit. I'm selling more time premium than I'm buying. Here's the current level of VIX. Here's my margin. So as I look at this, and generally, I say, well, is that okay? I'm short 87 deltas. My theta is 2414. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's no problem. Well, you say, why? Well, I mean, generally, 
especially when the characteristics of a trade are more shorter term here, OC 19 and OC 22. So those are gonna be whatever, 10 to 14 day trades. Um, <clears throat> if I can have my theta 10 times more than my delta on a short, where I have mostly characteristic shorter term durations, you know, my deltas are fine as long as they're, you know, uh, 10 times more. If I divide the theta 2414 divided by the deltas of 87, I mean, I've got a ratio of 27 to one. What does that mean? My theta is 27 times bigger than my delta. It just means, you know, you have two risks in, in any most trades, income type trades where we're bringing in time decay, you have price risk and volatility risk. Well, if you're short 87 deltas, it works like this. Keeping everything the same, if you're short about 87 deltas and SPX goes up 10 points, about what you will lose. Forget about gamma for now to complicate it. If you're short 87 deltas and SPX goes up 10 points, this is price risk, price, about what will you lose? 870, 870. So when I have theta of 2400, if we go up 10 points in the SPX just from the price risk and I lose 870, is the theta big enough to offset some of that? Yes or no? Yes or no? Yeah. And then obviously you look at Vega and look at that factor, but these are these are issues, you know, whether you're managing a hundred and sixty thousand dollar position or five million or 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 two thousand dollar position, managing it by the Greeks and getting used to managing this, even if you're more of a rules-based trader, I think you'll be a lot more consistent in your profits because it's much more accurate, right? Everybody would like, right? Everybody out there would say, Dan, I don't want to really know anything. Just just give me some kind of rules-based, when to put it on and when to take it off so I don't have to think. Well, the fact that you don't have to think, you're going to get in trouble someday because the person or rules-based thing you're looking on, they're not taking into account all the way the variables change. So, so let your head hurt you a little bit and learn how to do this, right? So, <clears throat> so that's what we're gonna go over over the, uh, the next three weeks starting two weeks from today is give you a much better feel of how to integrate all this, even on a simple, you know, if you're trading $5,000 of trades or $3,000 or 100000 or a million, whatever, how to look at these factors together. And we'll use live examples. We'll talk about it, try to make it very practical for you. So anyways, that's what we're going to talk about. More of a, that, that you have a much better working knowledge of how to use the Greeks, how to look at the Greeks as you're trading, right? It's, it, it's very important. Uh, Jim says, and if the risk management department starts moving everything, three standard deviations as they did in 1987, well, I think Jim's just talking about how when you're at your brokerage firm or how they, you know, how do they evaluate your trades? And that's, Something else I think we'll discuss in the class, you know, if you have a portfolio margin account versus just a regular account, how do they look at it? But again, that's what we're gonna focus on. Um, and I think it should be a big help to you. And and we're gonna put it in, 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 the, in the realm of just as a retail trader, as a retail trader, how can you use the Greeks to manage your trades? And we're gonna talk about most of the popular trades, which would encompass probably 95% of the trades you guys do, we're gonna talk about it and how to give you that edge 
of looking at the various creeks. Uh, Wayne mentioned market makers hedge total positions and have little risk, then collect time value decay. Is that how they operate? No. I mean, that's how they'd like to operate. Like Wayne's saying, I mean, ideally, wouldn't we all, right? Wouldn't we love to buy on the bid and sell on the ask? That's one of the functions of a trade or market maker in the pits, a wholesaler. Would we rather at the end of the day go home with no position or a position? In other words, if Wayne and I can buy in the bid and sell on the ask and make $1,000, would we rather go home with no position or a position? Would we rather go home with no position or a position? We'd rather go home with profits and no risk. But in the real world, right, in the real world in the pit, that never happened. We were a specialist. Uh, so a specialist in the pit would be more of a market maker with much more responsibility. We had to do most of the, a lot of the, more of the trading. Market makers is a lot different. Um, and so when we were the specialist, we had to carry large positions. We weren't, you know, we had the biggest positions. And, and who were we going to get out with? And we couldn't get out by the end of the day. So we had to carry these positions overnight. And so that's why we had to be aware of, you know, were we short? Did we want to be short volatility or long volatility? Did we want to be positive or negative theta? Where do we want our deltas were with going on in the market? And we had to, uh, so we weren't able to, you know, most traders aren't able to go home with uh, no risk on, unfortunately. So anyways, well, folks, I look forward to working with you in a couple weeks on this I think, very important class. If you're serious about doing this as a craft to try to consistently bring in income without a good working knowledge of managing by the creeks, I think it's futile. And so uh, look forward to it. Again, it starts two weeks from today, and you'll be able to sign up probably the end of today or tomorrow. It'll be on the website, and the folks have a wonderful week. And uh, we will, uh, if any of you are in Arizona or California area and can uh, want to come to the seminars this week, uh, let me know. We'd love to see you, and uh, take care. Thanks so much.